I'll tell you another story. It's starting to feel like uh, uh, Sheldon Cooper's Fun with Flags, if you guys watch Big Bang Theory. But it's kind of cool. Um, let's see. Around 1978, 77, 78 in there, uh, I got out of the Navy and didn't really have a a clue what I wanted to do. So what what wound up happening, I decided to hitchhike around the country for a while. And I I was basically homeless. But you know, I figured I was homeless by choice. I mean, most of the homeless people I ran into you know, they were homeless by choice. I'm not sure how that works out today, but back then, you know, that was basically a lifestyle. And I had, I don't know if you remember the old aluminum frame backpacks. Uh, I had one of those with a bed roll. And I hitchhiked probably nine months, ten months, all around the country. Um, I would stay at a, a KOA campground you know, somewhere and get a shower, you know, and things like that. Uh, once in a while, I'd make a little bit of money to stay in a hotel room. And the the thing about making money back then when you were hitchhiking, the highways used to be just filled with mom and pop type restaurants uh, before the Burger Kings and McDonald's and, you know, Subway, all that kind of stuff. Uh, truck stops were all you know, home-cooked meals, they weren't all these chain things. Uh, and I would go into one, you know, and I could tell the uh, cook or whoever in, in the restaurant, it's like, look, I haven't eaten, you know, yet today. Is there some work I can do to uh, trade for a meal? Uh, and I didn't feel like I was being a bum or anything. I mean, they had shelters and such, but uh, I was hitchhiking through. I wasn't planning on uh, staying anywhere. And I have to admit, every time I did that, I was, I was never refused. They were always like, oh yeah, you know, you can do this, you know, do something, clean this out, or go back and do this. And without fail, I mean, they always fed you, gave you a good meal, give you five or ten bucks, you know, and I'd be on my way. Uh, if I needed to make some money, if I wanted to, you know, like, stay someplace, stay in a hotel for a night or two, and uh, relax, I would go to a uh, truck stop and be a lumper, you know, unload trucks or whatever. Uh, I remember one time in Kansas City, I was at a truck stop, and this guy was going to pay me ten bucks, to wash out his trailer with, you know, power washer there. And he had two trailers, you know, that'd be 20 bucks to spray them all out. I'm like, cool. You know, I only did that once. I don't know how cows shit on the ceiling of a trailer. But you could, you know, imagine me in there with the sprayer ducking cow turds coming off of the ceiling as I'm trying to clean it. But, you know, doing those kind of things, it was not a, 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 you know, I wasn't hungry. I mean, I never did drugs. I've never been, you know, I smoked pop, but that was the extent of my drug experimentation. Uh, so I didn't have that. I'm, I'm, I don't, you know, I'm not a drinker. I was never into alcohol. So it, it wasn't any of those things. It's just that's what I felt like doing. Um, and I hooked up with this guy. You know, I met him on the road and we started hitchhiking together, you know, just hanging out. Uh, if we'd go to a KOA campground, you know, I'd watch his stuff while he went and got his shower. He'd watch my stuff while I went and took a shower. And it, you know, worked out all right. And uh, we were in, we were in Salt Lake City, Utah at a KOA outside of, I don't know, maybe Pro, it was in Utah. 
Um, I don't remember exactly where, but uh, he went, took a shower and everything. I had to set up camp, you know, and uh, he came back. So I grabbed, you know, my change of clothes and towel and everything, and I headed into the shower. Came back from the shower, and he was gone. Not only was he gone, but my backpack, my bedroll, I mean everything. Everything was gone. So, that pretty much bummed me out. I think he lived in that area and somebody probably came and picked him up. But that pretty much, pretty much bummed me out on my hitchhiking around, you know, and being a bum. I just, you know, got this, uh, I got discouraged after that. So I decided it was time to go somewhere and look for a job. And I wound up hitchhiking to Las Vegas, Nevada. Now this is Las Vegas in 1978. A whole lot different than Las Vegas today. Uh, in 1978, it was still pretty much mob run. Um, and it was a dirtier town. Um, you know, just, it was a gambling mecca is what it was. That's all it was for, gambling and prostitution, nothing else. You know, it didn't have the rides and it wasn't family oriented. But I wound up there and the uh, first thing I did was lose every dime I had in my pocket in slot machines. That was my very first day there. I lost everything I had. So I went to the Salvation Army and great organization. I love the Salvation Army. Um, I went in there and I told them I was a drug addict and an alcoholic and I wanted to get on their program because it gets cold in Las Vegas at night. Out in the desert, it will get cold. I wasn't aware of that. And the first couple of days there, uh, at, at night we would, there was a railroad trestle, you know, with a concrete barrier on each side of it going across a uh, highway or uh, the road. And what we would do is build a fire up against that concrete. And then you'd, you know, the heat would radiate through the concrete. We'd lean up against it for a while, then switch sides, you know. Uh, and I'm like, okay, this isn't going to work. This is not what I signed up for. So I went to the Salvation Army. They put me on their program, and it's okay. I mean, you, you, you get three meals a day, you get a place to sleep, uh, you have to attend services every night, but they take you uh, over to the, like they have a warehouse where all the donations go, and they have these different shops in there. The electrical shop would do, you know, work on stuff, and you know, things that they could fix up and turn around and sell through the thrift stores. And while you're on the program, back then, the way it worked, your first week they paid you $8. And then each week they added a dollar to that. So your second week you got $9, third week you got $10. And you slept in this big dorm with like 70 other guys. You know, it was like being in boot camp. Uh, and they come through at six o'clock in the morning and wake you up. So I was like, this isn't working out too well either. I wasn't pleased with that. And I went to the, the guy named John Ritchie, Brigadier John Ritchie, ran the Salvation Army back then. And uh, I talked them into letting me use one of their trucks and I went and got my Nevada driver's license so that I could become a truck driver for uh, the Salvation Army. And then you got paid minimum wage, which was at the time, I think, two sixty-five an hour. Uh, that was minimum wage. I got that, plus you got a little kitchenette type thing that four people shared. Uh, they took $30 a week out for like, you know, rent out of your $2.65 an hour, but you weren't in that dorm anymore. You know, I used to walk by the dorm after that, and I'd walk by and be like, get a job. 
you know. Uh, and between the truck driving and selling plasma, you can sell plasma twice a week. And uh, running coupons, any gambling or any, you know, used to be on airplanes you got these coupon books. And it was good, you know, at all the casinos they'd have, you know, get a free silver dollar every, you know, hour and free buffet and free this. Well, we'd run those coupons. And that's how I got money to gamble on. And uh, I had saved up enough money to go to dealer school and got through the Nevada Gaming Commission and got approved and got my license to deal 21, deal blackjack. And I walked over to the Holiday International Casino. Uh, the Salvation Army was on Bonanza Street, which was right off of Fremont Avenue. The Holiday International was over there at Fremont. So I walked there, auditioned, and got a job. And, you know, to be a dealer, to deal 21 there, your, your primary thing is not only to be able to you know, to be able to deal and count. But uh, you have to entertain the people. The idea is to keep them at your table. And uh, I was pretty good at that. So they hired me. And you got a part of the pay. If you were single, you got a room there at the Holiday International. So I got to move from the Salvation Army uh, to my own room there at the Holiday International. And I worked third shift, 11 at night till 7 in the morning, and in our group of tables, there were 16 tables in our crew, and with tips, I mean, you get tips like crazy, uh, they all, all go into a big, you know, bucket, and at the end of the shift, they're all split up amongst the people. and uh, they used to hate me because I always told, if somebody wanted to tip me, I'd be like, play it. And they stick that on the line of the box where they put their money. And if they won that hand, then my tip won, and I put that in my pocket. Generally, they lost, but uh, I did discover I had a gambling problem. And I would get off of my shift at 7 o'clock in the morning. By 7.30, I was sitting on the other side of the table drinking black Russians and gambling until my tips were gone and then upstairs to uh, to my room, you know. And I'd get up and go to work. Did that every day for, I don't know, three or four months. And got nowhere. So, uh, one night I got paid, got my paycheck, and there was a casino called the Lady Luck Casino at downtown Las Vegas. And if you cast your paycheck there, you got a free spin on the wheel. Uh, so I went in there and cashed my paycheck, and I hit a triple your paycheck, which wound up being like $400, $450, something like that. Wasn't much. Dealers got paid minimum wage. You made your money in tips, but I always gambled those away, so it didn't really matter. Uh, but I hit a triple my paycheck. And I took that money and I went to Binion's Horseshoe, uh, which also was downtown Las Vegas. Got on a craps table. I didn't play craps very often, but I got on this craps table. And I generally, when I played craps, I would bet it's called the wrong side of the table. Uh, I would bet the don't come, the don't pass, you know. Less money, but a little bit better odds because you're betting with the house then. You're betting that that guy doesn't make his number. And when he sevens out, instead of you losing, you win money. Uh, and this guy started shooting. And after a few minutes, I realized, okay, he's, he's actually on a streak here. And I started, you know, betting the numbers. And betting the pass line and the come line, you know betting on the side of him then, instead of the house. And he kept rolling and rolling and kept hitting his numbers and 
he would hit a number and I would tell the uh, dealer press it and what it is they slide you some profit and they take a little bit of it and put it on your numbers and I covered all the numbers every roll I had money on every number so regardless of what he rolled or what he hit I won uh, and just press it he roll and press it and roll and press it next thing you know there's a line waiting to get on his table because this guy is just kept rolling and uh, you know some people would place a bet win a few bucks leave then the next person could get a spot on the table man he just kept rolling and rolling and hitting those numbers and he finally crapped out he finally summoned out and I can guarantee I probably had three thousand dollars on the table that I lost uh, when he sevened out. But I looked down in my tray in front of me and I had pink and red chips. I didn't even have those as a dealer. Those were thousand dollar chips and I got a whole row of them. You know, and I'm like, wow, and I was, cause while he was doing it, while I was in there, I was like being in a zone and you don't even realize what, you know, how much money you're actually dealing with. So I went to cash out and I had $18,600. And so I told the, the lady, give me the $600, put the 18,000 in a box. You didn't have to uh, pay your taxes right then. Like they collect them now. I, didn't, I wasn't gonna pay the taxes right then. But I told her, put the 18,000 in a box. I'd be by the next morning, pick it up, take it to the bank. And I was getting the hell out of town. I was gone. So I went and gambled the $600 away. Next morning I went, picked up the 18,000. I did not even look down the street the bank was on. I went straight to Caesar's Palace, got a junior executive suite for three nights for me and my buddy, got us two hookers for three nights. And you know, four days later I was back at work with no money. You know, and that's when I realized, okay, I have a serious problem. And uh, I went back to John Ritchie at the Salvation Army. And I told him, I said, look, I got a problem. I got to get out of this town, but I can't leave. I, I, I need help. And uh, uh, he, what they wound up doing, they hired me to go to work for the Salvation Army in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was gonna manage the stores there in Albuquerque. So they bought me a plane ticket to go to Albuquerque. And uh, went to the airport, cashed that ticket in, gambled it away, wound up hitchhiking to Albuquerque. Uh, and it was funny because I'm talking to a guy and he said, you do not want to hitchhike through Arizona. They, Arizona was bad. And they would like pull up, shoot you, and then ask you who you are, the cops would. So I wound up hitchhiking from Las Vegas, Nevada to Bakersfield, California, catching I-10, and then I was planning on waiting for a ride that would take me all the way through Arizona. I was afraid to get dropped off in Arizona. So I caught a ride. I mean, I was walking up the entrance ramp right after getting dropped off. So walking up the entrance ramp, car pulls over. He asked me if I had a driver's license. I said, yeah. He said, good, get in. He was going to Albuquerque and then he had to head north, but he wanted somebody to help drive. So I drove pretty much to Albuquerque uh, and got dropped off and went to work for the Salvation Army there. And, uh, but that was my Las Vegas time, and uh, I know I have this, this disease with gambling, and I'll tell you, I don't gamble anymore. I have not gambled for, well, since I left Las Vegas. I don't buy lottery tickets. Seldom do I buy a lottery ticket. You know, if it's a $50 million pot, you know, and people are going in on it, I'll go in on it. You know, like, 
the four million dollar pot's not enough for me. I gotta have 50 million, I don't know. But I don't start, I don't do any gambling. I live five miles from a casino now. And uh, they've got a great buffet over there on Friday nights. They have a seafood buffet that is just great. And I can go over to that casino and go have the seafood buffet and walk out, you know, and you have to walk through all the tables. They now have card game, you know, they have blackjack and craps and roulette and all that shit. But I do not gamble. I know, I know for a fact the first time I sit down at a table and play a hand, I won't be able to stop. It will come right back to me. And there's a lot more important things that I gotta do right now than worry about trying to gamble. So, no gambling. <laughs> I don't do drugs, I don't drink, I don't gamble, you know. Uh, so it's a pretty clean life. I smoke cigarettes, that's what I do. And uh, I've gotten a couple of comments about, I loved one I just got yesterday or today. I said I would need more solar panels to run the oxygen generator concentrator after we move out here because I smoke. I don't care, you know. I will probably quit it sometime. The cigarettes here in Ohio cost, I don't know, 75% more than they do in, in Wheeling, and they're expensive in Wheeling. Maybe moving out here will make us stop. You know, we won't have any choice then. Uh, I think too, it may be, we may be busy enough out here and stay, you know, things to do and be able to quit, but I'm not worried about it. I'm not, I'm, you don't need to make suggestions to me how to quit, nothing like that. I have no intentions of quitting right now. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's another story uh, from my youth. I hope you liked it. Uh, if you did, I'll do more. I got tons of stories. I've had a, a very wonderful life. Got to do a lot of things in my life. And uh, it's fun talking about them. And this is not Shelton Cooper's Fun with Flags. <laughs> this is Joe off the grid laughing at some of the stupid things he did as a kid. That's what this is. So, uh, I will, uh, sign off now. Hope y'all have a good one. <laughs>